and welcome to The Honest Channel. I'm Claire Johnston, a 50-year-old journalist with a keen interest in how to age well and look and feel good for as long as possible. A couple of months ago, I interviewed the New York-based dermatologist Dr. Fane Fry, who's also the author of The Skincare Hoax. And she made the point that out of all the anti-aging creams and serums available to us, sunscreen is the best evidenced as a major preventer of photo-aging, which is the thing that accelerates the signs of aging like wrinkles, discoloration and sagging on our skin the most. The interview was well received by most out there and uh, there was a lot of interest in it. But among the comments, there were quite a few voicing concern around sunscreen safety. Now, to put that in context, the regulatory body in the US, the FDA, released updated research a couple of years back, which I'll link to in the description around the level of absorption into the bloodstream from the active ingredients in some approved chemical sunscreens, many of which are of course commonly used elsewhere, including in the UK and EU. Its studies showed that six common chemical ingredients, avobenzone, homosalate, octinoxate, octosalate, octocrylene, and oxybenzone, do make it into the bloodstream. The FDA said that that absorption doesn't mean these ingredients are unsafe, and they encourage consumers to keep using sunscreen to help prevent skin cancer. But they've asked the industry and other interested parties for additional safety data on 12 active sunscreen ingredients, and we await the outcome of further research. Now, rightly or wrongly, I rotate the sunscreens I use on my face daily and include a physical sunscreen from Verst, which is suitable for all skin types and doesn't leave the dreaded cast. So I will link to that and to further research in the description. The primary physical sunscreen ingredients, zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, are considered safe according to the FDA. FDA and additional data has not been requested for them. Now, sunscreen safety is a topic covered in Dr. Fry's book, and so I've asked her back onto the channel today to help put all this information in context for us and explain what it means. Dr. Fry, thank you very much for talking to me again. It's good to see you. It's wonderful to be back. Thank you for having me. Well, there, there was just so much interest in our last conversation because um, you were basically making the case and I thought, you know, pretty sensibly for, for sunscreen as the topical anti-aging treatment based on your own clinical experience and also what scientific studies tell us as well. And what surprised me about the reaction to that interview amidst the many positive comments from people saying that makes a huge amount of sense, there were a number of people, and this happens every time I mention sunscreen, there are always people who say they don't think it's safe. Um, and therefore they don't use it. And, and that always concerns me. So uh, I know that in your book, you talk about sunscreen safety and I wanted to get you back today just to look more closely at this issue, to really explore it and find out um, what we actually know for certain. So if, if I could start by asking you to explain the difference between the two main types of sunscreen that we see for sale, the physical sunscreen and the chemical sunscreen. Absolutely. Um, first of all, your your the comments in the last um, were wonderful, and it was really it was really enjoyable to read, and I'm I'm thrilled to be back. Um, and I understand the issue with um, ingredient safety because everybody wants safe products. Mm -hmm. um, but with that being said, um, and we'll get into the physical versus the chemical. I'm going to answer that question for you. Um, the question isn't whether there's no risk. There's a risk in everything we do, including mm -hmm. sunscreen. It's no different than driving a car. In the United States last year, there were 40,000 fatalities on the road. So there's a risk when you get into your car. The question is whether the benefits of wearing sunscreen outweigh the risks or the known risks of wearing sunscreen. And the answer to that question is absolutely. So, and that's based on all science that we can find, whether we're here in the United States using our filters or in the UK using your filters. Um, the answer to your question, sunscreen is a product that protects our skin from the ultraviolet rays of the sun, which are damaging to us, which cause the sun damage and the skin cancer. And it falls into two categories. You mentioned physical and chemical. Don't kid yourself. They're all chemicals. Okay. We call them organic and inorganic. Organic means it contains carbon. Or inorganic means it doesn't contain carbon. Inorganic are what you call the physical sunscreens, also called the mineral sunscreens. And these are sunscreens that have two particular filters in them, titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. And those two um, filters are used 
in the United States a lot. They're yeah. also used in um, in in the EU. Yes, all the other filters. And now, U.S. only has sixteen filters approved. Not all not all being used, but all the other fourteen are what we call the chemical or the non mineral sunscreens. Mm -hmm. uh, in the EU, you have about 30 filters. And again, of the 18 filters you have that we don't have, they're all chemical sunscreens. They're all chemical filters. So the right. difference between physical and chemical, um, if they contain titanium and zinc oxide, it's a physical sunblock. If it contains any of the others, it's a chemical sun sunblock. And there are different characteristics of each. But it's often alluded to that the physical sunscreens, you know, it was more of an issue with them um, causing a cast on the skin. But I had imagined that they would be, if, if any of them are in any way remotely toxic, that that would be the less toxic one to go for. Well, the chemical sunscreens absorb the light. They have a chemical reaction. They release heat. And yes, they can be photosensitizing. We can talk mm -hmm. about they have been found to absorb into the blood. That doesn't mean they're risky, but they are in the blood as many mm -hmm. things are in our blood. Um, they are less inert. Like you said, titanium and zinc are more inert, less likely to react to things. So they're usually mm -hmm. recommended for children, people with sensitive skin, um, but interestingly enough, when you look at the efficacy of sunscreens in independent studies like Consumer Reports, which is large here in the United States, when you look at the efficacy of these products, sunscreens that are made with chemical filters are usually more efficacious than the sunscreens made with the mineral sunscreens. They work better. They hold mm -hmm. the SPF better. They have less variation when you put them on. Um, mm -hmm. They're just better products. They, prote they protect your skin from the sun better than the physical sunblocks. I'm not saying no physical idea. sunblocks are inadequate. They are adequate. And if you're worried about all any of these other issues, and I would encourage you to use them. But mm -hmm. like you said, you can have a white cast on the skin, which for my color skin, I, I don't, it's not a big deal. But for people with darker complexions, it, it's not fun for them. And aesthetically, they're not as appealing as, as aesthetically as some of the chemical sunscreen um, products. So, I mean, for those people who are concerned about absorption, into the bloodstream of chemicals. Um, I mean, the physical ones, are some of those chemicals absorbed into our bloodstream as well? Is I have never seen a study that showed the physical zinc or titanium have been absorbed. They, are, they, are, yeah. they don't have positive percutaneous absorption um, into the blood. Yeah. Uh, but again, just because it's absorbed, don't, that doesn't mean it's unsafe. That's what the FDA is, is looking into. Um, and I know people were scared by these absorption studies but the recommendations um, from the FDA was don't stop using your sunscreen. They were absorbed at a level that was just a little higher than the FDA allowed before we had to look to make sure they were safe. So it's not that they said, oh, they're in the blood. The, the FDA has a, has a level, it's a 0.5 nanograms per mil. If anything is found in your blood above that, they say, hey, wait a minute, we just want to take a closer look. And that's what they're doing. They're taking right. a closer look. So, um, you know, again, that, that did create some panic and, 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 and whatever. But remember, these products have been used for 50 years and there's no compelling evidence whatsoever yeah. in any data that the benefits of using these products um, don't outweigh the risks. Right now, the benefits of using sunscreen, because remember, we haven't talked about skin cancer. What happens if mm -hmm. you don't use these products? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a benefit risk issue. And yes, everybody wants safe products, myself included. And yes, we need better research. And that's what yeah. uh, that's where we're at. So, I mean, when you when you started out saying, well, there's a risk to everything. I mean, you, talk, you mentioned road deaths and so on. And you said it's no different for sunscreen. I think people will immediately be thinking, well, how big a risk is that? And um, and we don't know. I mean, what's your sense when, when you use, use sunscreen? What do you use? And what do you consider the risk to be? I use the chemical sunscreen. I like the aesthetics of it. I think it works better. Um, you know, um, I just, I'm comfortable with it. With all that being said, um, I don't put on a lot of sunscreen because my exposed skin is minimal. It's my face, my neck, my ears, and my back of my hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't put it on all over my body because I'm wearing clothes, which is what I'd suggest. Minimize the amount that you really need to use by minimizing the exposed skin. Um, again, if you wear clothes, long sleeves, and you have minimal sun, uh, skin exposure, you don't have to put on a lot of, 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 of sunscreen. And, and that's what I suggest. Remember, for 50 years, these products have been used, and there's plenty of research 
I was just reading one. Uh, they reviewed 29 clinical clinical studies about the efficacy of, um, or, or um, what is it, um, oxybenzone, which everyone's worried about mm-hmm. now. And, yeah. And it also included the Tinazorb, one of the filters in the EU. And um, these these products, they're present in the oceans, they're present in the Baltic. I mean, again, you could argue that these mineral sunscreens, remember, these don't dissolve. So maybe they're floating around in our waterways. Yeah. Um, there, there's, there's, again, there's risks and benefits to everything. Yeah. Yeah. And to date, the benefit outweighs the risk of wearing any one of these sunscreens, in my opinion. Yeah, no, that that does make sense. Um, I mean, one thing I do, um, rightly or wrongly, is I alternate my sunscreens. And that's partially because I've got a few that I like. um, And so I just have them. But um, I tend to go between a couple of chemical sunscreens and a a physical one that I've got. and I would use that sort of every other day. So I'm rotating and, and presumably, therefore, you know, one of the things you're trying to avoid to lessen any risk is a buildup of chemicals. So, I mean, it's highly theoretical, but by just alternating different products rather than using the same thing day in, day out, do we in some way lessen the risk, do you think? I don't know, because you could get one, the sunscreens that are being absorbed may not be hazardous, but yet you're putting on a small one, a little bit of one that is hazardous. Remember, it's the dose. It's not the chemical. It's the amount of the chemical, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You take a Tylenol every day. You take a 500 milligram Tylenol, it'll get rid of your headache. But you take 20 Tylenol or acetaminophen, which is the generic, uh, you can knock out your liver and be dead in two weeks. It's not yeah. the acetaminophen. It's the amount of acetaminophen. By the way, those absorption studies, not the single use, they did have some absorption uh, after a single use, but they didn't reach the levels. My understanding that the FDA said, wait a minute, we have to look. Unlike the maximum use studies that did. So they put on sunscreen, uh, I believe it was four times every two hours for three oh, or four days. Full body. Full Full body, 75% of the body. Oh, yeah. And yeah. they found the, where they were too high, which I think it's great we do these studies, but how many people put sunscreen on a yeah. full body four times a day for several days in a row, maximum? It's just when used in usual and customary conditions, most people don't get that kind of exposure. No, no. I mean, but that is the kind of exposure that you could be applying to yourselves and your kids when you're on vacation or holiday. Um so, you know, pe- people are going to look at that and, and feel concerned. Yeah, yeah, we should. Right. We should. We yeah. definitely we, we should. We need safety studies. But, you know, that's uh, that's again, we have history. Yeah. Um, plenty of studies looking at the detrimental effects associated with sunscreen. And they really haven't found anything compelling right now. The benefits, again, of wearing sunscreen, whether it's chemical or, or, or physical blocks, far outweighs the detrimental sides that we know of. And why? Because we know what skin cancer rates are. We know how many people are getting them a year. We know how many people are dying of skin cancer and we know the protective effects of sunscreen. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thought of not using them when you're out in the sun, particularly when you're exposed, you know, you're you're out in the full blown sun in summer um, is, I I can't imagine why people wouldn't want to do that, you know, wouldn't want to use sunscreen in that situation Uh, because just even the discomfort of burning is so awful but um, I know several people who um, have fortunately got got through skin cancer but I mean it's a a terrible thing to happen. Just going back to the FDA where are they at the moment I mean how long is this going to take this investigation and are they are they looking across all the um, the approved filters at the moment or just some or what, what, what's going on there? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a stalemate. What happens is in the United States, again, sunscreens are regulated like drugs. And mm. in 2021, they there was a ruling that they um, they have to determine that sunscreens are G-R-A-S-E, generally regarded as safe. And to do that, they must look at animal studies, toxicity studies, right? Genotoxicity studies, absorption studies. They have to look at human clinical studies are required, right? For sensitization and pre- reproductive uh, effects. Um, they have they have to do these human studies. They have to do animal studies. Um, and this isn't necessary in the EU. You don't have this requirement because in the EU, your sunscreens are regulated like cosmetics. Now, so to... To approve a filter in the EU, they use what they call um, 
I guess, physical chemical studies, which are, they just look at the, the qualities of the product itself and the stability and how well it protects against ultraviolet light. So the requirements are very different. They're much more stringent in the United States to pass safety. I'm not saying they're not safe in the EU. They may be good enough, mm -hmm. but the FDA is requiring these studies. Mm -hmm. It's costly. And they have, re they have requisition from companies that have made at least eight of the filters I know that are available in the EU that aren't available here. And, and they haven't received that data. It's yeah. expensive data to get, and it's expensive to these companies. And they're saying, can you relax some of these requirements? And the FDA is not willing to do that. So the whole regulatory process here is much more arduous than it is in the EU. So yeah. it's more difficult. They want to make sure these, you know, absorption studies, sensitization studies have to be done on animals and on, and on humans. Mm -hmm. I mean, in any in many ways, this conversation has echoes of one I had recently um, with the doctor in the UK about hormone replacement therapy, and we were talking about the the risks of that um, versus the benefits. And of course, that doctor was saying, "Well, look, you know, there's other there's way bigger things about our lifestyle that we should be concerned about before we start looking at hormones. You know, particularly where there's such a, a such a benefit." And I can't help but feel the same about sunscreen. You know, I mean let's look at our diet first, how much we're exercising. You know, it feels to me like if we can get the basics in life right to support our health, we need to worry less about um, things like this. And there's steps that we can take, like you say, just restricting the amount that we use so that we're just covering our faces and anything that's exposed. No, I agree. The advantage to some of the sunscreens that are available, uh, though, in the EU is they do have better coverage, especially of the broad spectrum UVA, the long wavelengths, which is mm. something that's really missing here in, in, in the US. So the stalemate is uh, it's unfortunate. Um, companies don't want to offer the, the, the regulatory necessity that the FDA is requiring. The law is the law. So until the law changes, I don't see that changing. Um, yeah. And um, unfortunately, the consumer loses out because they don't get the great coverage, which I think they could get, and or the aesthetic coverage. Some of these chemical sunscreens are really aesthetically very nice. Um, yeah. And um, so I think the consumer loses out. But again, basically, based on hist history and, and usage, I think all the sunscreens, both in the United States and in the EU, uh, I think there are plenty of great choices. Um, and uh, I think it would behoove everybody to wear one because in my opinion, based on science, and my clinical experience, the benefit of wearing sunscreen every day far outweighs the risk of not wearing it every day. Yeah, and I think we have our own regulations here in the UK, but they're pretty much going to mirror that of the EU. I mean, one of the, the groups that people do flag to me when they're talking about sunscreen safety is the Environmental Working Group. I don't know if you're aware of it, the, the, the group of scientists who um, have raised concerns around specific sunscreen ingredients. You mentioned oxybenzone. That seems to be at the top of their list of um, of filters that they, they think we should avoid. Um, I mean, what, what's your view? Well, I like groups like that because they keep industry on their toes. I, I, yeah. I think watchdog groups are great. They, you know, they're, they're again, they're trying to advocate for consumers, which I, I appreciate that. Mm. The downside to those groups is they don't they don't necessarily look at research in a um, an unbiased way. And, and there is a little pay for play going on. I don't know whether you, you know that with environmental working group. There's some you know, you have to pay to get the seal. And so it's not totally unbiased. They also to their own admission, all so often they give a low data score when they'll say we have no data. They'll have no or limited data and they'll give a score because the science isn't there. Right. Which is unfortunate because the consumer is looking at this. The other unfortunate thing is a lot of the studies they do look at are animal studies. And mm -hmm. Claire, you and I know animals mm -hmm. don't all metabolize things the same. No. So they'll give high doses of something to a rat um, and it'll have a bad effect. And they'll then extrapolate and say, oh, this is a bad score. But look, I have we have, you know, dogs. You, you I can eat chocolate, but you can't give chocolate to a dog. I was just thinking that because I've got an older dog and she doesn't take the same medications as any of us. Right. We metabolize things differently and they don't take those things into consideration, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So it's not the greatest science, um, you know, review of science that they base their scores on. They have very lim limited data, but to their own mm -hmm. admission on many, many of the products, mm -hmm. they over they overscore some things, they underscore some things. So I like the I like the theory behind the watchdog group. I just don't think their tactics are very accurate. So it's yeah. I use it with a grain of salt. Yeah. OK. And I mean, we talked about um, skin cancer risks 
I mean, are you aware of any of the, the data? It seems to be on the increase um, skin cancer diagnosis. Yeah, cancer rates seem to be rising, but we are spending more time outdoors. People want a more leisurely, uh, you know, lifestyle. Um, I don't know. I do believe more people are using sunscreen. I don't know that for a fact. I'm not sure we're using it enough or mm. staying covered. You know, again, sunscreen is one part of comprehensive sun protection. Hats, yeah. long sleeves, avoiding midday sun, going to your picnic at three o'clock, not at um, noon. Um, so you, you make a good point. Seven, I think seven people a die of skin cancer a day in, in, in the uh, UK. We lose about 22 people here in the United States a day. Wow. I mean, yeah. it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. We have three, over 3 million cases are diagnosed now in the United States a year. So it is, um, it is, it is not insignificant. And no. that is one reason why sunscreen is really imperative. Okay. Well, I, th I think that's very helpful. Um, I mean, there's, there's still going to be a lot of questions around it. That's for sure. But, but we don't have all the answers at the moment. I mean, if you had to put a bet on the, on timelines for the FDA and when this all gets resolved, uh, I don't think ideas. it's going to be resolved in the near future because companies don't have the resources or the money to to offer the tests and the FDA has to follow the laws that have been passed and until the law changes. So I think we're pretty much at a stalemate. Um, I hope it changes. If I could be any part of that change, I would I would volunteer. I think it's a it would, it would benefit, again, the consumer. Yeah. But I do think based on what we know today, based on the science, what we have today, wearing sunscreen of any kind broad spectrum, SPF 30 or higher on as, as little skin as you can because the rest is exposed mm -hmm. um, and then enjoy the outdoors. I think that would be the my best advice. Yeah, cover up and then use sunscreen on the parts that aren't covered up. Brilliant. Okay, thank you so much for your time again. Um, that That's helped me out a lot and uh, I hope it has other people as well. You're welcome. And if anyone has any questions on the website, Fryface, F-R-Y-F-A-C-E, I have a contact us. If there's any particular questions they have about any particular ingredient, I'm happy to answer them. Oh, fantastic. Because I get a lot of questions and now I can just put them your way. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Clearly, we still have a lot to understand when it comes to the chemicals in sunscreen and how we use sunscreens. But one thing we do know is that it's very important to protect our skin from the harmful effects of the sun. And as with all things in life, it's about striking that balance around frequency and amount of use of sunscreen and also covering up. So I hope you found this interview helpful. Until next time, thanks for watching and listening.